Michelle at our staff meeting uh, this last week informed us that uh, your theme for the year is his dream and my dream, is my dream. And I love that so much. But just for a moment this morning, I want to take it a step further and make it a little bit more on the ground. I want to give you um, two irreducible elements uh, to King's dream. If you've read or listened to any of the sermons of, uh, of Dr. King, you know that he talked about the beloved community all the time. It was very, very important. And when he talks about dream, his dream, he is describing this beloved community. I find that really interesting. Beloved community. By the way, I, um, if you've not done much reading or, or looking at uh, Dr. King's work, uh, you can find so much stuff on the King Center right here. You can find that uh, on the internet. And I would encourage you to take a look. Um, but from there, uh, there's a, a quote I'm going to read to you. You can follow along. I think we'll project it. This is uh, Martin Luther King. But the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. Is it this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends? The type of love that I stress here is not eros, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, or philos, the, the sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is, these are Greek words, by the way, um, it is the word agape, which is understanding goodwill for all men and women. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of people. This is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. So he talks about this idea of the beloved community. I'm going to take just a few more minutes, and I'm going to give you two of the most important things about this beloved community. The first one is this, justice. Say justice. justice. That's at the very center of Dr. King's idea of the beloved community. The ch challenging thing about the term justice, though, is it's kind of like silly putty in our culture. It, uh, people kind of mold it into whatever they want. Uh, and, and we could spend some time unpacking that part. But the reality is he had a grounded belief in a biblical vision of justice. It had to do how, with how he believed the Bible described the way life should be for all people, regardless of a person's social or economic class, their national heritage, their ethnicity, their family, their economic status, their education, regardless of any of those things, uh, everyone deserved justice in their lives. So let me just unpack this just for a moment. Let me, let me build it out. <clears throat> in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the word for peace is the word shalom. And it's a concept, uh, obviously in, in almost all Bibles, it's translated as peace, but when we say peace is the same thing as shalom, that means Shalom really means the absence of something. It means that uh, there's no war or violence or, or conflict. That would be peace. But the concept of shalom is much greater than that. It has to do with overall and universal well-being for all people. Prosperity for all. One particular theologian I love is a guy named Walter Brueggemann. And he describes it this way. Shalom is a persistent vision of joy, well-being, harmony, and prosperity, a vision with many dimensions and subtle nuances, love, loyalty, grace, salvation, justice, blessing, righteousness. Shalom is the freight of a dream of God that resists all our tendencies to division, hostility, fear, drivenness, and misery. Does that help you a little bit? When we think of shalom, it's much greater. What, they're, what he's saying is it's a con it's a concept of universal prosperity and well-being. It's a word that represents how all things were originally supposed to be. This is, his dream was built on the way God created all things with equity and equality. Shalom. See, here's the deal. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter where you're at in religion or faith or whatever, non-faith, whoever you are. Almost everybody I talk to can imagine a way that, the thing sh that things should be. If everything were right, if everything were equitable, if everything were the way it's supposed to be, everybody has a little bit of a dream of what that would look like. That's what King talked about. 
we can all imagine that. The Bible talks about how the shalom, though, was injured. This writing of all things, it was broken in, in a sense. I don't know what you think about when you think of the word sin. You probably don't go around thinking about it all the time like sin. You know, you, you probably don't do that much. I mean, for me, before I was a Christian, I didn't think about sin ever. I mean, I knew I did things wrong. I was just too busy being my weird self to actually think about it very long. So I just go on to the next thing. But oftentimes we think of sin in a, well, maybe you have a picture of some preacher standing on a corner with a bullhorn going, you're all sinners, you're all going to go to hell. Uh, I've seen that. I have not done that, though. <laughs> the most precise understanding of the word sin for me is, and in the Bible, is when something violates or injures shalom. When <clears throat> one author says this way, it's when shalom is vandalized, it's injured. So anything, anything that moves away from the way God intended all things to be in its most perfect sense, that is what the Bible calls injustice, a step away from what is right. When the shalom is violated and the way things are supposed to be are injured, we define that as injustice. I hope you're kind of following my little rabbit trail here. So the Bible talks about the correcting or healing of that brokenness. Here it is, ready? That's what the Bible calls justice. Is the writing or correcting or healing of those broken aspects, not only in our own hearts and our own lives, but in our country, in the systems that oppress people, all of those things, when they're righted or corrected, if you can imagine that, that is what the Bible calls justice. I'm going to give you a little, <clears throat> little rapid-fire scripture here. Ready? This is from the Bible regarding justice. And, the, and just so you know, the Bible mandates that people of faith um, champion justice. Okay, here are some verses. I'm going to project them so you don't have to just trust me on it. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 31. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Here's another one. Isaiah 1, verse 17. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's case. Here's another. Jeremiah 22. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Do no, do no wrong or violence to the foreigner or to the immigrant, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. Jeremiah 22, Zechariah 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice, show mercy, and compassion to one another. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. Here's one from the New Testament from the words of Jesus. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, which can be trust translated justice, and all these things will be added to you as well. James, chapter 1. I'm almost done. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep one's uh, keeps oneself from being polluted by the world and lastly psalm 82 defend the weak and the fatherless uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed now listen that is just a a thimble full of what the bible says about justice it, it's uh, it strikes me as so odd that somehow churches can get this so confused and conflated with something else that they don't think justice is a part of who we are. Yeah, you could say amen. amen. This is a sad story, I think. Okay, this is the assignment. Ready? When you think of every verse that I just read, what are the actions that are supposed to be taken in the realm of justice? What do these say we're supposed to do? Defend. Take care of, yeah. Just go ahead and shout them out if you can 
What's that? Respect. Beautiful. Stand up for. Protect. Do no, I'm sorry. Love. Do no violence. Render true justice. Show mercy. Look after. Uphold their cause. Justice is literally at the very center of faith. By the way, I did one of these cool little things last night. I didn't really know I could do one of those. But I'm just going to do this right here. That is what we just read. Mm -hmm. Justice for all was central to King's dream. He said this, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Did you hear me? Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But the formative thought behind that quote has to be understood. And it's less popular. This one doesn't get quoted as much uh, on the World Wide Web. Justice is indivisible. Did you hear me? Justice is indivisible. Do you understand what that means? It means it can't be divided. It can't be processed or parsed out. It can't be, I'm going to give some justice here, but not justice here. Justice goes multi-directional. Every person in this room, every person you've ever locked eyes with, justice is for them. The beloved community was a picture of restored shalom. And um, maybe you haven't read a ton of King, but you need to understand that this was at the very center of who he was. The second thing, first one is justice, say justice. Justice. Second one is love, say love. Love. It's an element of the beloved community. I would say it's even the foundation of the beloved community. And here's the deal. Love is one of those silly putty words too, only even more so. Because uh, in this last week, I've said these exact words. I love Thai food. I love the Oklahoma City Thunder. And SGA, if you're not a basketball fan, you have no idea what I just said. And I love my wife. Those are not the same things. (laughs) Those are not the same things in my head. I can say love for all of those, but they don't mean the same thing, right? You get that? So when we talk about love, we have to think about it in terms of the way King talked about love, and quite frankly, the way Jesus talked about love. That is where, that's where King got this idea. I don't know if you know that. (laughs) I mean, the fact of the matter is, he defined love in a way that was otherworldly. I mean, obviously, all of us are aware of all of those different types of love. But the thing that made the beloved community different is because it was from a different place. The fact of the matter is, King's love was unique because it included his enemy. It included people that despised him. Listen, if you don't get this about all this, this movement that we're talking about today, you're missing the center. Because it's so easy to love people that love you. If, uh, listen, if someone likes you or expresses affection towards you, it is so easy to return that affection. Although we even get trouble, in trouble on that sometimes. Like, they didn't give affection like I wanted it. Right? I get a name man from back there somewhere. Because we've never had anybody sit back there before. Just want to make sure you're, yeah, there you are. Uh-huh. King's love was, listen, here it is. You need to remember this. Nonviolent resistance. In other words, um, people were against what he was doing even violently. If you read, uh, read The Strength of Love, and, and he tells stories about how his life was threatened over and over and over again. His house was bombed. His children were threatened. All these things happened. And the most natural thing for everyone in this room to do at that point would to be retract or become violent as well. And that's what made the thing different. That's what made the thing different. Love requires a different way. The love that King was talking about was greater. It was greater than. Greater than what? Greater than everything. Greater than anything. That's, that's why 
uh, people couldn't ignore him. There were plenty of people like me standing in churches talking about love all the time. But the difference is, are we willing to love those who hate us? This is king. Nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon. It is a weapon unique in history which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wields it. Another place, upheaval after upheaval has reminded us that the modern man is traveling along a road called hate in a journey that will bring us to destruction and damnation. Far from being the pious injunction of the utopian dreamer, the command to love one's enemy is an absolute necessity for our survival. Love even for enemies is the key to the solution of the problems of our world. Jesus is not an impractical idealist. He is the practical realist. Here's another thing he said. I've decided to stick with love. It's too great of a burden to bear. Again, but this is, I don't know if you know this, but this was... This next quote, he, he put in a handwritten note to somebody, and here's what it is. It says, love is the greatest force in the universe. It is the heartbeat of the moral cosmos. He who loves is a participant in the being of God. Let me give you one more. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. See, when we talk about the beloved community, if justice and love are not at the center, the dream is less than. Everybody in this room has dreams of the way they want the world to be. It's kind of hardwired into us as people. But what is our dream? Is it really our dream? His dream is my dream. When we talk about his dream, we have to understand what it is. We can't just say, yeah, I, lo I love that. I saw it on... Social media, that's good. By the way, Dr. King was probably the, probably the most uh, misrepresented per person, maybe outside of Jesus, <laughs> in the entire history of the Western culture. People have formed him into their image, even to the point where people who would probably try to kill him today quote him. Let, let, me, let me wrap this up. Um, years ago now, <clears throat> I played basketball in college and then I coached high school and college basketball for, for quite a long time. And I was the assistant coach at a college and uh, it was on Martin Luther King Day. <clears throat> and we were going on a road trip. And I was sitting on the bus with this young African American guy and he was saying to me, um, man, I wish everybody would listen to Dr. King and do what he talked about. And just so you know, I, I agreed. I, I was a pretty young guy at that time. I'd not read one word of Dr. King at that point. But I'd heard of him, and I said, yeah, yes. And I appreciated him. But in my head, there were other things going on. His statement created dissonance in my head, and this is what it was about. <clears throat> I thought, well... Dr. Martin Luther King is just like me. He, he was. He was just like me. Ready? He was a pastor. Just like me. Every week of his life, he did the same thing I do. I have to work really hard to come up with a sermon that doesn't say the same thing every week. So people don't go, yeah, I've said that. He said that already. I can go now. I mean, he, he had to work hard to come up with sermons. He had to do hospital visits with sick people. He had to visit shut-ins. He had to preside over board meetings. He had to do all the stuff that every other pastor has to do. He's just like me. <laughs> Excuse me. I think, I think in my head, it was probably, you know, when you're, you're if you're competitive at all, you want to win. And as he was talking, I thought, I have to make him a little smaller so I can be okay with myself. And the reality, I was doing self-aggrandizing stuff like, yeah, yeah, he's just like me. Now, just so you know, it never came out of my mouth. That was really good. <laughs> that was good. I, I'm so glad I never said any of that nonsense. 
He is, and this is true, did many of the things that I currently do, and if you read about him, he did it with all his heart. People want to embrace the doctor part of Dr. King, but they want to whisper the reverend part. But as I've read more about the reverend doctor, I realized that he was very unlike me. He was literally drawn into one of the, if not the most important moments in the history of our land. God used him and his courage to change the way millions of people think about oppression, exploitation, and racism. The funny part is, if you read, honestly, I, I want to encourage, just, don't, don't just read the quotes. Pick up Strength to Love and just read it. Because the funny part is, he didn't, he was a reluctant revolutionary. It wasn't like he was looking for trouble. You know what it was? What, what he really wanted to be is a reverend. By the way, the, his doctorate was in theology, if you missed that part. But here's the crux. He unflinchingly clung to a God who held two things as paramount for life. Are you ready? Say justice. justice. Say love. love. <laughs> and because he had resolutely committed to those two things that got him in the good trouble. Because of his resolve about those two things, there was literally a gravitational pull on his life. Not only himself, but the systems of oppression around him. He, he was like me. Um, in one way. But I, if I can be candid with you at this particular moment, um, I want to be like him. <laughs> I'm 65. I, 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 I want to do life the way he did it. I want to, even though, I mean, if you read his story, he was afraid. But he didn't let his fear stop him from his resolve to do justice and to love mercy. We all should want to be like him. Where we, like the psalmist, I love this translation of Psalm uh, 85. It says that we would all be like the psalmist, where it says mercy and truth have met together, justice and peace have kissed. That we would be those people that hold those two things together. Do justly, love mercy. Those two things have to be wedded together, friends. If they aren't, Justice without mercy and love becomes severe and injurious. Love without justice becomes sentimental and weak and whimsical. What does God want from us? What does God want to do with you? Even if you're reluctant and unsure or not confident. Friends, uh, new friends, old friends, Salk middle school friends, will you with me make an uncompromising commitment to justice this morning? Whatever the cost, will you with me choose today to love all people, even the people that are against you? Those two elements are the irreducible aspects of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. And if I can take the liberty to express one other thing, in its core, the church, excluding the nutty parts, that's the dream of Jesus. That's the dream of Jesus. And sadly, people who say, yeah, I'm Christian, we get our eyes off the stuff that we're supposed to have our eyes on. And then all of a sudden, we, people start going, well, Jesus doesn't make sense. But if we just look at the real Jesus, he was the justice and he was the love. So this morning, uh, church, friends, visitors, I'm so glad you're here. But I pray that we actually get the right picture. I hope that we have the right thing for us to put our eyes on today. Lord, I ask you to help us. I ask you to give us hearts um, that will be reflexive 
to do justice, to be reflexive, to love others, that we will unflinchingly stand with those on the underside of power, that we will uncompromisingly stand with those who are exploited or injured, that we will not flinch when it comes to be people who see uh, a world that hurts others, that actually separates others, that moves people away and even divides folk. Give us hearts of courage. Give us hearts of passion. Give us hearts of resolution this day. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.